Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fired Up, the podcast for marketers working in early and late stage startups. I'm Morgan McClintic, the CEO of startup marketing agency Firebrand. We've launched this podcast to interview the best in the business, but I'm not going to do it alone. So please meet my co hosts. I'm Nicole Pytel, Firebrand's VP of Content Marketing. And I'm Chris Ulbricht, Firebrand's Head of Media Relations. I'm Ian Lipner, a tech PR and crisis communications veteran. We'll drop a new episode each week, and so there's plenty of fuel for your marketing fire. Get the spark you need to take your startup to a whole new level. Hello, and welcome to Fired Up the Startup Marketing Podcast, where we explore trends and provide tips about building brand and driving demand for your startup. My name is Morgan McClintic, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Chris Ulbrich. Hey, Chris. Great to be here and excited to be talking about a fascinating topic we have on tap today, which is how to name your brand. It seems so simple, but as anyone who's tried it knows, it's so hard. There's so much to consider. Everybody has an opinion So what's the process you need to go through to find the right name for your brand? And just as important, how do you know when you found it? Lucky for you, we have just the guy, Anthony Shaw. Now, Anthony Shaw names things, and he's done this for over 30 years. He's brought more than 250 products and company names into the world. Names like Tonal, Accenture, Fitbit Sense. Yum Brands, which is the company that owns KFC and Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the weird science of naming new products. He's been interviewed by the BBC about naming best practices, which has been viewed over a 100 million times. He's a linguist with product management and marketing expertise, and he's the CEO of Operative Words. So, Anthony, it's my great pleasure. Welcome to Fired Up. Thanks so much for having me, Morgan and Chris. I want to start with something topical. Everyone's talking about the rebrand of Twitter to X. And you at the time mentioned that this isn't a rebrand. It's more of a debrand. So let's just talk about that. What do you mean? Yeah, this is a debrand because anything that has made this thing a brand has been removed. And let me let me explain that. For one, he's dropped their proprietary name Twitter and their proprietary logo for an off the shelf letter, just a letter that, you know, is just a just a typeface that you could click on your keyboard. And so it's, you know, barely a, a logo at that. And it's just a letter. It's also not distinctive or differentiated. There's so many other X's out there, including X brands owned by technology companies like Microsoft. On top of all that, he's also Drop proprietary language, like replacing the word tweet with a generic word post. So in every case, we have like a genericization of what used to be a brand. He's also dropping what made Twitter unique, he says, for this ill or non-defined mishmash of features to become this so-called everything app. So anything that made this thing a brand has been removed. And it's it's my case that this is really a non-brand at this point. Twitter has been fully deep branded. Yeah, I think it's a good example of how not to, to do it. So when we talk about naming, let's just take a step back and you know ask a basic question. Why is then a good brand name important for a startup? And if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm thinking about where to spend my time, I've got to spend my time on building the product, I've got to recruit the team, I've got to name this thing, Like, where does naming come in? That's a good question. There is no sharp and bright line that can be drawn that says here at this point, you need to come up with a really good name. Because the truth is, is that when a company starts up, you know, their focus is probably going to be on product. It's going to be on engineering, you know, especially in technology. It's it's not going to be on the branding or the marketing. And yet, um, at a certain point, this team is going to need to be actively marketing their product to investors as they go out and try to raise funds. So they need something that's going to work in that context. Now, they don't necessarily need a great brand name at kind of an early stage of that, especially because early on, a company may pivot. Their whole purpose may change over the course of weeks or months or years. And so, 
you want to be cautious about entering into a naming exercise when you're not entirely sure what the future focus of your company is going to be for the long term, what your value proposition is. And so naming should come in after you have an idea of what your product definition is, what your market is, who your audience is. Maybe you've done a little seed fundraising, so you have some funds. And then at that point, it might be a good time to invest or to begin a naming exercise, whether you engage someone on the outside or not. Once you get past the decision that you're going to move on from a placeholder name to your future brand name, then it's important that you spend time thinking deeply on that, including what your future is, what your positioning is, who your competitive set is, and and how to separate yourselves from that. So that will require involvement and thought from startup founders by the time that they go into that exercise. So to be effective and they or whoever they partner with can develop a name that will stand the test of time. As someone who has participated in these exercises before, I am fascinated to hear your views on who should be in the room and who maybe shouldn't be in the room. Because I think there is a tendency, especially in early companies, to get consensus on a name. I wonder, is that the best route Or do you need to sort of rigorously select the group and who is going to be involved and who should that be and how should they proceed? You want to have the optimal number of people in the room, which means it's not too few and it's not too many. Branding is not a democracy. Really, the quality of your final name is inversely proportionate to the size of the team. So you do want the team to be as small as possible. However, you don't want to bring important people in at the very end and have them derail a process because they weren't involved. They had important things to say or their perspective wasn't taken into account. So you need to have the right size team in the room. That means specifically you must have the naming decision makers in there. They need to be there for the brief and whatever the name presentations are, and any other very strong influencers that might be involved. Typically, a board of directors is not involved until after a decision has been made or near that point. There's some risk that attends that, you know, waiting at the very end if the board has to approve a name, but there's ways to incorporate whatever their thoughts are ahead of time. So that's really how many people should be in the room on most projects. It's going to be anywhere between three and six people to give you a hard number. At very large companies, you should expect that you're going to have a core team of a handful of people and then figure out a way to sell in the names up the flagpole. And that's not something, honestly, a company should attempt to do themselves without professional help. Because the hard part about naming is, in my estimation, not coming up with the name, but in selling in the name and getting a room full of people to agree that this word should be your future. So this isn't something that a startup should do lightly or on their own. I mean, I guess you might be a bit biased, but should someone always bring in a consultant, a naming expert like you? How does that really work? It's a nice thought, Morgan, but I don't think it's realistic to expect that of people. I think what you, you need to do is arm startups with the information that they need so that they can have a capable go, an effective go at creating, screening, and selecting and selling in and ultimately executing their name. I absolutely believe a startup can do this on their own. The odds of being successful are not all that great, however. Because naming is so counterintuitive, right? We think, for example, we're going to know the name when we see it. And yet you're not going to actually know the name when you see it. The names that you gravitate towards immediately, you probably can't have. A person may find themselves continually frustrated with names that they immediately like but cannot have. And so there's some counterintuitive dynamics that go on with naming that make it more difficult than it seems like it ought to be. So I think if a company, a startup is going to do this on their own, they need to kind of get smart on naming. And there's, um, I write about naming on my blog at operativewords.com, but there's a great book which recently came out called Brand Naming by Rob Meyerson. 
I do, full disclosure, make a small cameo in the book, but it's a book that I believe takes the right approach on inculcating the process, strategies, tactics when it comes to brand name development. So I think if someone reads that book, reads some posts I have on my blog post where I give away for free everything that I know there, then you could have a go at it. And if you're young enough as a company and don't have a ton of funding, what else are you going to do? That's probably going to be the approach you take. So on that note, if a company is launching into this exercise by themselves, you know, at a high level, what does a good process look like? The, typically, uh, you know, it just involves people sitting in a room, whiteboarding ideas until they find one that everyone can agree on. And it might be a lowest common denominator outcome. What's the better version of that? I personally don't believe that group brainstorming sessions are useful or productive for name development. And uh, the most productive development happens with individual creative development. And so if people are coming up with names kind of on their own rather than brainstorming in a group, it's more likely to be effective. People are going to have to do uh, sufficient research to go beyond the low hanging fruit that is going beyond merely looking up synonyms of desirable attributes in a thesaurus or obvious and well-known words that have been used a lot. You need to get past these things. It does require a depth of exploration that requires considerable time development. So the process is a company should first agree on the strategy for naming, come up with a set of name objectives that articulate what should the name supporter connote. Are there attributes or associations that would be desirable, as well as technical parameters, such as where does the name need to be available and what kind of domain would we be comfortable uh, getting you know, or settling for? Once you've established that strategy, people should do their creative development. And on my blog at operativewords.com and in this brand naming book by Rob Meyerson, there's examples of different creative exercises there and different kind of kind of lateral thinking exercises in order to identify names that will be differentiated but relevant. There's also websites that can be used for these kinds of things. And I'm not talking about the new websites that incorporate AI to do name development. I'm, I'm not necessarily crazy about the output of those things, although it's certainly worth a shot. I'm talking more about other sites like Rhyme Zone or One Look. Sketch Engine is incredibly powerful. That requires a subscription. Or WordNick, you know, sites that are by and large freely available that can really bring forward some interesting ideas if you know how to look at them. After some time in creative, when everyone's created a very long list, there's going to have to be a selection made and you want to put a large number of names into knockout screening. I'm not talking about domain screening. That is far less important than trademark screening. And this may be kind of an unpopular opinion, although not amongst professional name developers. There's really nothing more important than the trademark. The domain pales in comparison to the name itself and the name's availability. You will find an available trademark and a search engine will get people to the right place if you found a good differentiated name. So you wanna make sure you put enough names in for trademark screening, have a lawyer do some preliminary trademark screening or attempt it yourself on USPTO.gov, I believe. Then ultimately you're gonna do a full search on a couple of names in order to pick one final name. Now, when you do that selection, you're not going to be going by comfort. You're going to want to think more about what names are interesting to me. What names dovetail into our story? What names can engender excitement and interest and stories? So different names will have different kind of levels of inspiration. Some might just sit there and others might trigger a lot of associations, right? I would pay more attention to those that engender many associations. If there's a detractor in the room, that is a normal part of naming and often indicates the most powerful names, which might in fact end up being polarizing when first exposed to people. And then at the end of the day, a client would ultimately select one final name. For the .com, they can, for a domain, they can go with modifying their name by adding a descriptor there or hello blank, or you know find a different top level domain, like instead of .com, maybe .co as an example. So it's very much a process. You don't fall in love with the one that you personally love and play favorite with a particular name. So, you know, you have to go through this. 
legal and practical process. How do I know when I've got a good name? Some people detract from it, but it's very familiar with me by the end of this process. How do I know that it's good? How do I know I've got the one if I'm dissociating my personal preference from it? Names become right. You might believe some names are born right, but names really become right by virtue of how they are used. You may not really know if it's the one because the the one will become the one after it's launched. Like you can't imagine Apple as anything other than Apple, but I swear to you, it absolutely could have been a different name. You won't necessarily know that it's the one. You will know after you've developed an identity system around it and put messaging around it and then launched it and have customers come to you, that's how you know you've done the right thing. But when I show 50 names to a client, I'm showing them 50 futures, not one future, 50 futures. And any one of those names could be their future. You want to think about kind of what do you want your future to look like? It sounds like it's also an active process of taking whatever name you've come up with and shaping your fu- with the future you want around it. And so that gets us to a point you touched on earlier, which was the process, once you've ch- settled on a name, of selling it up to the key decision holders. And I'm wondering, what does that process look like if a company does not have access to a professional? And how is that related to selling it to the broader public? In both cases, you need to make your audience see in front of them what this is. If you show someone a word on a page, whether it's a customer or a chairperson, they may not know what to do with it. It's going to be too hard and too much to ask, I think, to beg them to imagine a whole universe and world that's implied through this one word. You need to show a name in context. And that's something that that I do when I present names is that I will, for example, take their existing web page and Photoshop out their existing name and drop in a new name so that it looks like a fait accompli. And you need to do that when you're selling a name up. So I start when I unveil a name, for instance, to a board of directors, all right, who has not been involved with the project, but it's got the buy-in from everyone else. If I'm unveiling a name, I'm first going to set it up typically with a statement or a question. And that one statement or question has as its inevitable answer the name, right? So you say something pithy, a question, a, a vision, whatever it is, such that the name is the inevitable answer to that. And then you expose the name and hopefully there's an identity around the name already, or at least it's made to look good and not just a word on a page. And then you want to show the name in some kind of a visual context, typically a customer facing context. You would mock something up or maybe put together some some different exhibits. You'd want to counsel your audience on how to feel. You know, don't expect that you're going to fall in love with this immediately. You want to think about how could this name inspire you? What can we do with the name? How does this dovetail with what we want to tell people and how does it distinguish us? Those are the kinds of tools that I would use to help my audience embrace a brand new name that they've never seen before. This is quite a big exercise. And just hearing you talk, I wonder, is a name just as important for a B2B brand Accenture, which you were involved with, as it is for a consumer brand, Tonal. Should B2C brands take naming even more seriously than B2B brands? No, it's all business to person. Everyone, whether you're acting in a professional or a personal capacity, You have a brain, you're human, and you react to names just like everyone else. You may have a procurement department that is going to go looking at metrics to ensure that, you know, this is something that, you know, your company wants to buy into, in which case the name may or may not have a difference. Although if you have a reputation, that'll that'll really help. But I, I believe names in B2C are just as important as B2B, because at the end of the day, you're selling to people who make decisions and you need to appeal to them. In your experience, how are the considerations different in when you're appealing to a B2B audience versus a B2C audience? I could imagine for a B2C audience, you are trying to communicate excitement, flash, novelty, whereas for a B2B audience, you might be trying to communicate more stability, reliability. And how does that play into storytelling? Can you tell a story in the same way with a B2B name that you can with a B2C name? I don't actually believe that there's any categoric 
difference between B2B and B2C on the tonality of names necessary that you'll be looking at with the exception of, you know, names that might feel more racy or scandalous, you know, are generally going to be off the table for a B2B brand, whereas in certain consumer categories, it might be okay. In the case of a B2B or a B2C brand, you're typically looking for a brand that's going to be reflecting certain qualities or attributes. And those are universal, whether you're looking at selling enterprise software or you're looking at selling something else, there's going to be certain attributes you want to evoke in the name. And so I actually believe that the exercises don't necessarily have to be altogether different. And if you look at a lot of technology names, a lot of names for developers, for instance, and at a certain level, those are B2B names, but they've got some of the coolest names out there, you know, and they have names that are kind of sometimes kind of dangerous. So I don't believe that there's a categoric difference. I think that at least when I name, I'm naming to a set of qualities, a set of attributes, a set of desired perceptions. And yes, if I'm naming baby food, it's the list is going to look a lot different than if I'm naming enterprise software or a fashion brand. Do you have a preference when you're naming between a house of brands like a Facebook with Oculus and WhatsApp and Instagram and now Threads? Versus like a branded house, Google with Google Workspace and Google Docs, et cetera. And how does that relate to their parent brands? Like both of those companies have Meta and Alphabet. Tell us how you're thinking about that. I honestly enter projects typically with a bias that names should not be multiplied beyond necessity. I tend to prefer not to create names willy-nilly. I believe that a company needs to have a lot of discipline when it comes to the development of their brand names. And when I'm working with a startup and, you know, we're thinking about sort of the development of their company name, I would also advise them typically that their product name should just be generic descriptors tied to their company name, that the company name is the one brand that they should focus on and build. With larger companies, it might be something different. It's really going to depend on, does an existing brand lend itself to an extension such that creating a new brand name would be superfluous? Can you elevate what you already have and simply extend that brand rather than create something new? At the same time, I genuinely believe that a product is going to succeed most when it has a name that's really developed for that product. In contrast with my advice to minimize the number of brand names, I will advise if they're looking at a couple of products launching around the same time, if they really are different than developing a best in breed name that's perfect for each of them. I would not uh, tend to demure on considering thematic naming systems. So here, we're developing three products. We want all three names to be related. And that is a dangerous route. That is a risky route to take because you can paint yourself into a corner because you might come up with a good name for one of them, but to get something else in the theme that's legally available for the other two, you have to reach so far out there and come up with something so weird and obscure, it doesn't really work as a name. I tend to say, look, let's just develop three awesome names for these three products, and you know they'll live together on the same page as part of a family, if you want to present them that way. I was curious about the trend that I think it might be petering out now, but curious your take on the practice of naming companies after nonsense words became popular in the first flush of a dot-com era. And then I would say in the mid 2000s, we saw a lot of companies pick names that had no meaning, but they just sounded like something. Sort of curious about your take on that genre of naming. Those names did have some popularity in the past, and they still continue to show up today. In my experience of looking at a landscape, you know, those landscapes they have of like the AI sector or the enterprise platform sector where you see hundreds of logos on one page, I look at those and I see plenty of nonsense words there, plenty of fanciful made up words there. That is still happening and that's still out there. What's happening less, which is really nice, is that companies have less Google and Yahoo envy. There was a point where companies really loved that ooh sound because there were some 
companies ascendant, which had that sound in them, like Google and Yahoo specifically, and companies chase that. I'm not in favor of emulating directly what another company has done. I think you should be your own thing and be distinctive. So today I see the gamut of names that are adopted. I'm seeing super interesting real English words out there. I'm seeing foreign words. I'm seeing completely made up words. I'm seeing modified real words. I'm really, I'm really seeing a gamut here. I am seeing, I believe, less dot-com desperation. That is, names that have multiplied arbitrary consonants, deleted or added vowels just to secure a dot-com. I believe I'm seeing less of that in the marketplace now, which is great, because you shouldn't do that. You should just develop an awesome name that you can own from a trademark standpoint and then figure out whatever domain you can use that's available to you, the SEO and the search engines will take care of it. You know, no one is typing your name into an address bar on your browser, okay? Everyone's going to a search engine and they're going to find you that way. So your SEO needs to be right on. And that's why one reason why you need a distinctive name in your category so that it'll stand out and rank high on search. To that point, I want to talk about rebrands. We touched on Twitter and X, which I think is a different case. But we once had a client that had to rebrand twice, which may speak to the importance of the legal review there. But is there ever, in your mind, like a need to rebrand? And if so, why does that come up? The most notable instance of this is a a process called infamicide. Infamicide is when a brand dies through infamy through something terrible that's happened, and it's become infamous. For example, 10-ish years ago, Visa rolled out a credit card called ISIS. And then that turned out to be wildly wrong when, uh, you know, the terrorist organization called ISIS came to be. So they had to change the name, so the brand died from infamicide. So that's a good example of when you might need a rebrand. And of course, if you're spinning off a company, that's a rebrand of a type. PepsiCo decides it no longer wants to be in the restaurant business, so this new business has to have a new name. Or in the case of Anderson Consulting and their parent company, Arthur Anderson, they got into a legal battle. Anderson Consulting had to split off, was legally required to do a rebrand and change its name. Then you have situations where rebrand is not called for, but it's done anyway. Twitter debranding to X is an example of that. And HBO Max becoming just Max is an example of that. I disagree fully with Warner's decision to remove HBO as as a flagship brand in, in this way. I think that was a mistake. On the other hand, you have Poor beleaguredoverstock.com, which has changed its name a lot of times, like to O, they were O.com for a while. And now they just bought Bed Bath & Beyond, which is brilliant. That is awesome. What a great use of this brand name, which probably still has some fine equity to it, right? So we have examples of rebrands that shouldn't have happened and were mistakes. And we have ones like this, which was absolutely brilliant and a wonderful stroke. Just to sort of as we come to the end of this, I want to ask you a question. What advice would you give to startups when it comes to naming? It will take more exploration than you think it will. It will take weeks or months. You should kind of bake that in. Don't expect you're going to know it when you see it. And don't go by comfort. At the same time, not that this is going to happen, but don't fall in love with one name. Okay. just in case you do start falling in love with the name, don't. You need to wait until after your full legal screening, then fall in love all you want. Okay. you need to be good with a group of names, at least 10, maybe 20 that go into some level of legal screening before you start getting too excited about any names. Instead, you always want to think about what name is interesting to me, even if it makes me uncomfortable, what's interesting to me. Always do your legal screening from uh, and have the trademark clear through your legal counsel and then figure out your domain. Perfect. I think that's brilliant advice. Brilliant advice for everyone out there. Okay. I want to go on to our next section, which is called smart people and dumb questions. In this section, we have a bag. I have it right here. I have a bag of questions. I'm going to pull out a couple of questions and just ask you these ones. So the first one is what game show could you win? Who wants to be a millionaire? Perfect. Lots of friends to call to get some advice. 
What's the oddest thing that you have ever eaten? I ate some fried bull testicles when I was visiting Texas or somewhere in the Southwest. How did those taste? They were delicious and I was shocked. Very different from anything else I had, but they were fried. So, you know, it had that kind of unctuousness to it. Otherwise, kind of hard to describe, but it turned out to taste really, really delicious. So at this point, would you make a special trip for bull testicles? No, no, no. It's not not that good. No, not a special trip. And I've already got the t-shirt. Would I eat it again? Maybe. Mine was crocodile, and I thought it was pretty great. Tastes like chicken, like, you know, snake or all those other things. But I think you definitely win on that one. What was the first concert that you ever went to? I saw the B-52s in 1980 at the Beacon Theater in New York. I grew up on the Upper West Side near the Beacon Theater, and I saw the B-52s in 1980. That was their Wild Planet tour, which is their second album. And Kid Creole and the Coconuts opened up. I've been a long-standing B-52s fan my whole life. And very recently, I was lucky enough to do a meet and greet with them backstage here in San Francisco and get my picture taken with them and show them my ticket receipt from that first concert from 1980, which I still have in my ticket stub collection, which is significant. Wow, that's amazing. What a great opportunity. Just brilliant. I think I went to Eurythmics, Wembley Arena, with Annie Lennox, which was just brilliant too. But I, I think you, you trump it on the B-52s and get to meet them later on. Live music is one of my important hobbies. I see band live music almost every single week. I was lucky enough to see maybe 80 or 100 Grateful Dead concerts back in the day. So live music is continues to be an important part of my life. So our next section is quick fire round, the fired up five, where we're going to ask you a quick question, need a one line answer, and we'll take it from there. Here we go. What would you do if you weren't a naming expert? I'd cook. I like making food. What is the best career advice you were ever given? I can't control other people's emotions and you can't either. Uh, The only thing we really have control over is our reactions to the things around us. And so we should never cede control of that to anyone else. Uh, We're fully responsible for our own reactions to things. That is good advice. What is the tool you can't do your job without? The internet. (laughs) It's no, it's absolutely true. And it's one of the big changes in our, in our lifetimes, isn't it? Now it's everything about is indispensable. What hot trend have you got your eye on? AI. Okay. And then that brings us to our final overhyped or underused. It's overhyped, then underused at the moment. And it's going to become, it certainly isn't underused. It's it's already starting to creep into overuse, given its capabilities and like the horrible news articles you see out there that have obviously been written by AI and fake books written by the AI that people are selling under other people's names. So there's some overusage that's happening there. But the potential of this, I I don't think is is being overhyped. AI has been a partner of mine for a really long time. I I actually did a self-designed major in AI back in 1986 and 87, doing uh, coding and LISP and natural language processing. And the new instances of AI are pretty interesting to me. And older versions of AI pre-ChatGPT are actually incredibly powerful, much more powerful than ChatGPT4 because you can have more direct control, but it's much harder to work with. So I'm super excited to see where AI is going to take us. Anthony, it's been great having you. Thank you for sharing some of your advice for all of our audience about naming. And, you know, it was great to get to know you a little bit better. I did not know some of that. If some of our listeners want to get in touch with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Through uh, operativeworks.com, there's a form that they can reach out to me directly. There's also my profile on, on LinkedIn. Wonderful. And we'll put all of your contact details in the show notes too. Anthony, thank you for joining us today. It's been great to catch up with you and we uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I've loved talking with you guys. Thank you so much. Well, that about wraps it up for today. But before we close, we did want to offer all of our fired up friends a chance to grab a mega pack of all of our eBooks and guides. That's our guide to content marketing. That's our startup guide to paid media using Google Ads. It's our guide to attribution. 
You can get all of those over 100 pages of goodness at firebrand.marketing forward slash fired up freebies. That's freebies with an S. And we hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please give us a rating wherever you get your podcasts or drop us a note at firebrand.marketing. And as ever, the details of how to get in touch with our guest today can be found in the show notes. Thank you for listening. And until next week, get out there and crush your marketing goals.